you guys saw me walk out in the middle of that song because I had to go back there and ask the Murphy family if they had asked Onika for that song because it just goes so perfect with what we're doing here today. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how God works. It's amazing how God does things. It's amazing how God is, is involved in his worship. You know, that we think that we come in here to, to worship God and we do all these things. But the most beautiful part about coming to worship God is not what we do, but it's what God does in the midst of that worship. You know, where we experience him in a powerful way. And sometimes we come, you know, and we're, we're like, you know, we want to worship God and we want to do everything so beautiful for him. But it's like you can never outdo God. You can never outdo God. And he just comes and, sh and shows up. Uh, uh, you know, today is uh, uh, it's a special day. Uh, one year ago, we, we lost here from our church uh, a beautiful person, Cheryl Murphy. And um, there's a big loss to our church. You know, I, it's impossible for me to look back there to that back of the church and not think of her. Uh, and and one of the most important things was when we you know when we were going through the through the pandemic and going through this that was uh, Cheryl and Carol's little place back there where they would work packing beans or rice or whatever and the food that we were we would prepare uh, you know to to send out to people we had the police department would would come here and pick up the food that we would prepare in here in our church. We turned the church into a food distribution place from a worship place to a food distribution place because the church has to serve no matter what. And, uh, and they were here every Monday, uh, you know, preparing food, preparing, you know, to, to feed those that were in need. And uh, their family has done something special. Uh, if they could... If they could come up here, you guys, you guys come up here. Uh, they have, uh, they have done something special. You know that out there we always had, uh, we always had a bench out there when you, uh, when you came, came in. If we could have the pictures up uh, uh, of of Cheryl and also, are they uh, back here? Here is, here's the, the bench that they have, they have made. If you see it, you probably saw it up front already. Her husband, Dan, came this morning, and he, uh, he put it, bolted it down back there. He bolted it down so none of you would take it home. Make sure. <laughs> okay. Hur uh, hurricane. Uh, hurricane. Okay, we'll say hurricane. That's all right. <laughs> you know, we'll say hurricane. You know, but thank you, uh, Dan, for, for doing that. And our church would like to thank you for for making that for the church. And it's just so great that we can, we can remember Cheryl. And uh, we took those pictures there this morning. And uh, we really would like to thank you and dedicate this day. We're dedicating uh, this bench out there to Cheryl's memory and, and everything that she represented to us. And I want you to know the Murphy family and, you know, Carol and that we you don't know how special it is for us that you decide to do that in our church. You know, to have this bench put at our church. We appreciate that so much uh, because it lets us know, you know, it lets us know that, that you knew that this church was special to Cheryl. You know, that this church was special to, to, to her and that we, and we loved her and we still love her. You know, one of the things that, that uh, the church... Um, the Bible says that blessed are those who die in Christ because their works will continue with them. The things that we do in this world, the people that we are, the things that we represent, they never end. They continue on. And for you to do this this day, now that it's been a year, and you bringing it here to our church, man, this is, we feel so special. We feel so special. Because this is all of your church. 
your family. This is your church. This is Shore's church. This is your church. And we thank you so much for that. So today, we, uh, we dedicate uh, this, uh, this bench here to the church uh, in the name of Shirley and so that we may remember her every time we come in that door. We'll come in and remember and remember that. We have, we have uh, these roses here, and, you know, and we wanted you today as maybe if you leave this place or it's been a year and a few, uh, as you go by to her place of rest, that you may put these flowers there for us in behalf of the church. Can we do that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> let, us, let us have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for special people that you put in our way, Lord. Special people that you bring to our church. And today, Lord, we... Uh, we want to thank you for bringing Cheryl and giving us the opportunity to know her and to love her. And now, Lord, she is resting in the Lord, waiting for your second coming, Lord. And we ask that you may guard that place, Lord. We ask that you may give Dan, we ask that you may live, give Carol and all her daughters and family members, Lord, sisters, that you, Lord, may bless them and give them the strength that they need, especially to go through this one year now being without her. It was one year of going through all the holidays, one time, first time, without her. And I thank you, Lord, for the strength that you've given them. And I thank you, Lord, for giving them love for this church and to doing this for this church. So today we dedicate that bench out there, Lord, to remember everything that she was, everything that she did for this church and everything that she represented. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. It's a... Uh, Church is, uh, is just such a, such a special place where uh, so much goes on that has to do with, with our life. So much goes on that has to do with, uh, with everything that happens in, in, in our life. And when we can share these things, when we can share our life with, with the church, we become a family and, and things just, beautiful things just happen you know, within, within the church. So, you know, sometimes we, we, we come to church and, and sometimes we're so afraid to give, we're so afraid to open up, we're for, so afraid to become involved in church, we're so afraid to, to do things, and, 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 and we become people who come to church and enjoy, and then we, we leave and never really become, never really become part of church. If, if that is... If that is you and that's what where you're going through, I invite you to, to, to become more involved in church. Be part of the family. Uh, don't be an outsider. Uh, we will love you. We will accept you. We will deal with whatever you have in your, in your, in your life. That's who, that's who we are at Origin. And, and don't, be, don't be afraid. Maybe, you know, we, you know, sometimes people go through situations where they've been beaten down somewhere. You know, and it doesn't have to be at another church. It just be, just be the world, you know. And, and, and sometimes we build up these walls, you know, to, to protect ourselves from, from being hurt again. But you know what? If you, you, sometimes you just have to take a chance. Sometimes you just have to put the walls down and allow some people in because you just might find that place. You just might find that person who's going to accept you just as you are just as you are. And, and this is what, what Origin tries to, to be, a place where, where everyone is accepted, everyone is, is here. We will preach the truth. We will preach what the Bible says. But everyone is loved and everyone is accepted. And we, and we try to, 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 to show that as, 
as a church. Uh, so uh, I just want to today, I just want to give you just an invitation to be, to be a bigger part of the church, to join in, join our cell groups, join our stuff, be part of us. Uh, needs that you have, let us know. Let us know if there's anything that we can serve you in. You know, we are, we are here to serve you. We want to be, we want to get in your business, okay? We want to get in your business. We, we, we want to know all your gossips and all that kind of stuff, okay? We wanted to know everything about you. But at the end of the day, love you, although we know, okay? Because that's what Jesus does, right? He knows everything about everybody. But yet he still loves us, right? And that's what the church needs to be. We've been studying from the book of Matthew about the kingdom of God. And we've been, this has been a, a special series. And, and one, of the, one of the good things is that sometimes as, as you guys listen to a pastor preach, they think that a pastor is preaching uh, what he already knows. And you don't know that sometimes as we prepare sermons, we're learning ourselves. Okay. And, and the thing is, that's what gets me excited about preaching. In fact, I'm so excited about this series that Carl was supposed to preach this week. And I called him. I said, no, Carl, bro, I got to keep preaching. <laughs> I said, you know, I got to I got to continue. I got I got to continue this this series, you know, because uh, I don't want I, I, I you know, so we're talking about the Beatitudes. I don't want to lose the strings of it. I don't I don't want to to get away. I want to just uh, finish this Beatitudes as we go through it because they, they go one with another. Now, when we look at the Beatitudes, we have to understand the Beatitudes in the context of the kingdom of God, okay? We have to understand it between that because the main theme in the book of Matthew is the kingdom of God. Why? Because Matthew was trying to prove to the Israelite nation to the Jews of his time that Jesus was the king that they were waiting for. And John preached the kingdom of God is at what? Is at hand. Jesus himself after that said, also he said he went about teaching that the kingdom of God says healing, preaching, and teaching that the kingdom of God was at hand and then he told his disciples we went over those verses already this is a continuous i i i you know go back and listen to about the first you know last three sermons or four that i preached on this so you can get line up you know so you can line line them up and and then he tells his disciples go first to the those of the the house of israel preaching them and teaching them the gospel listen jesus adds this The gospel, in other words, the good news of the kingdom of God. In other words, when Jesus came, it wasn't just that Jesus was born. It was also the establishment of the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. Because, see, the kingdom of God is not just something in the future. What's in the future is the physical kingdom of God. But what already happened when Jesus came is the spiritual kingdom of God. And we as a church make a mistake when we, when, that, that when we think of the kingdom of God, we only think of the future, and we don't think that we are now in the kingdom of God. And those who accept the gospel are now accepting citizenship in the kingdom of God. So therefore, when you enter and you accept Christ as your Savior, you are entering into his kingdom and you are accepting Christ as your king and you as the subject of that king. Okay? Where now that king is the Lord of your life. You need to understand that context. If you are not willing to allow Jesus to become king over you or or for you to be the subject of of Jesus, then don't enter the kingdom. You are not part of the kingdom. Okay? So when he gives the Beatitudes, he teaches the Beatitudes in that context that the Beatitudes are the characteristics of those who belong to his kingdom. Therefore, it is unjust. It is unjust to ask someone 
who has not decided to become part of Christ's kingdom to live according to the characteristics of the Beatitudes. You can't. Because only those who are part of this kingdom can reflect those characteristics. So when, people, when, when you see people acting the way that they do, it's because they represent the characteristics of the opposite kingdom. Because that's the kingdom they live in. But Jesus says, if you are part of my kingdom, these are the characteristics of my kingdom. Okay? So when you study the Beatitudes, you have to study them within that context. This is not just some little beautiful thing he's given. No, it is a Magna Carta. It is saying this is the Magna Carta of the kingdom of God. And if you are not willing to enter into these things, then, then you're not part of his kingdom. Right now, there are two kingdoms in this world. And you have to decide which kingdom you want to belong to. And when you decide to belong to the kingdom of God, there are things that God wants to put in you. It is not your decision. It is your decision is to accept his kingdom. Then it says, and I will put my spirit in you. And I will cause you to walk in my ways and obey my laws. And you will walk in my paths. You become his subjects. He becomes your Lord. And you are obedient to your Lord. The problem is, remember, yesterday, we, we, last week, last week, seems like yesterday, right? Last week, last week, what we said was that the problem that the frustrated Christians or the Christians who have a very frustrated in this world are Christians who want to be in the kingdom, but with the characteristics of the other kingdom. Then you're going you're gonna to be frustrated. Those who are in the kingdom of God by faith, they walk according to the characteristics of the kingdom of God, and therefore they are happy and they are blessed. Amen. They are happy and they're blessed. Why are you not happy? Why are you not blessed? Walking in Christ and you're always crying and you always got an issue and you're always complaining and you always can't do it and this is so hard to do and this is whatever. It's because you're, you're trying to be in this kingdom and following the principles of the other kingdom. Now, just as the rest of the Bible, the Sermon on the Mountain was written, and those are, uh, you know, as, as part of the kingdom, you got to remember, and, and I've said this to you before, and it's a mistake that people sometimes make. The Old Testament was written to who? To the Israelite nation, right? Was written to the Israelite they, they were the ones who were alive, okay? It wasn't written to the Philistines. It wasn't written for the Philistines. It was written for God's people. The New Testament was written to the church. It wasn't written for the unbeliever. The problems that are announced in the Bible are not the problems of the world. They are the problems of the church. So stop reading the Bible for your neighbor who's not even a believer. No, it's for you. And for me. Paul wrote to the letter of, to the, to the church of Ephesus. To the church of Corinthians. To the Christians in Rome. To the church in Galatia. You, you get it? Paul was not writing to unbelievers. He was writing to believers. So the problems that, that the Bible talks about are, are Christians. We are the problem. We are the one he writes to. It's not to the unbeliever. So when he writes here, so this right here is to those who belong to in his kingdom, and we have to understand it, that our, it is within that context. 
Jesus, Matthew portrays Jesus in his gospel as, as the new giver of the law. Remember, the, 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 the main theme in the whole Sermon on the Mountain is God's law. But God's law within what? Within the heart where the kingdom of God now should be. And he portrays him as the new Moses. Giving now the law. Giving the law now within the heart. And, and, and he's saying, listen, Christianity is not about doing. It's about being. It's about being. And the problem is that a lot of times that for a long time, the church has emphasized doing and not being. And this is why the world says, why should I be a Christian? You talk with your mouth, but when I see you acting and being in the world, you give me no reason at all to go to your church. Because we forget that it's not about how we dress. It's not about what we look like, it's about who we are as people. It's about who we are. Now, who we are now comes out in what we do. Being and doing go together. The problem is in what order you put them. Doing won't change the inside, but the inside will change the doing. Okay, it has to do with what emphasis you give. The Beatitudes actually go in order. The first one is supposed to be first. Because it is where the person realizes that, that spiritually they don't have what it takes to be part of the kingdom of God. Remember we say, you know, blessed are those that are what? Poor in spirit. We went that over last week. Blessed are those that are poor because first you have to realize that there is an emptiness before you can fill it. If you are full, you can't fill it. So one of the first things that those who belong to the kingdom of God and enter his kingdom realize that they are poor, that you have nothing to bring to the table. It doesn't matter how faithful you've been in your marriage. It doesn't matter how, what good things you've done. It doesn't matter how many people you've helped. It doesn't matter how many sermons you've preached. It doesn't matter how many evangelistic meetings you've given. It doesn't matter how many sermon, people you've baptized. None of that matters. When you enter the kingdom of God, the first thing you realize is that you have nothing to bring to the table. That you are poor. That you are needy. That you need God. It's the first thing you realize. And then the one we went over last week, also those, it says, it said, blessed are those who mourn. Because not only you, I, I love the order it follows, because there's a specific order that it follows. You realize how poor you are. But then when you realize how poor you are, you don't only realize how little you have to offer. You don't only realize how poor you are, but you realize how sinful you are. You begin to see that your thoughts are like, whoa. Your thoughts. And you, be, you realize that God can see your thoughts and that God can know your thoughts. You realize that when you help that family out, you were really looking to be appreciated and noticed. See, and you look deep within you, you say, wow, what am I? So you see that within yourself. You, you realize that, you, you learn that like every deed, every, no matter how good it is, we ourselves stain it with our sinful nature. It's like our righteousness are, are like rags. 
you realize that? And blessed are those who mourn because they realize that. And they mourn because they realize how sinful we are and how everything we do is just stained. Our best deeds, Steps of Christ says, that the best deeds of a human being are stained by sinful nature. See, people, that is, those in his kingdom realize that. And then it says, blessed are the meek. Oh, God, there's nothing that will make you meek more than when you realize that. When you realize you have nothing to bring to the table. See, that guy, why he goes in that order? Because you realize you can't bring nothing to the table. And then you realize who you are. And when you, when you realize who you are, and you, that makes you humble. It makes you, 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 you know better than anybody else. That you, be, you, you could have been going to church your whole life, and you still know better than the person who came in yesterday. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. A spiritually meek person is not self-willed. Not continually concerned with his own ways, ideas, and wishes. They are willing to put themselves in second place and submit themselves to achieve what is good for others. Meekness is therefore the antithesis of self-will, self-interest, self-assertiveness, meekness, puts self completely aside and puts God's will as number one and puts what God wants as number one and self is completely put aside. This is the third characteristic of those who belong to the kingdom of God. But as you see, I want you to see, I want to repeat, that is a result of poor in the spirit. Realizing who we really are in our sins, then that steps you into an area of meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Sounds good, all right? Put on a shirt, right? Meekness is not weakness. Sometimes we confuse the two. But the difference between a meek person and a weak person is this. A weak person can't do anything. A meek person is, on the other hand, can do something, but chooses not to. In Spanish, the word for meek is manso. And in Greek, also has the same meaning that it does in Spanish. In Spanish, the word manso goes to a powerful animal like a horse, right? That he's strong and powerful, but yet he allows you to ride him. He can kill you with one kick, but yet he allowed you to ride him. And that is the meaning in Greek also. So meek is not a weak person. It is a person who is very strong and can do damage, but chooses not to. Because he is strong. He is strong to control his own feelings. He is strong. See, weak people are the ones who talk what they shouldn't talk. Weak people are the ones who say, I just had to tell him, you're weak, that's why. I just had to get it out, because you're weak, that's why. You have no control over your mouth. Like I say, I, like I tell, some, you, know, you know, sometimes I say, hey, your, your mouth is on I-95 and your brain hasn't left the, your garage yet. Your words hurt people. 
You talk without thinking because you're weak. The person who's meek is strong. And they're so strong, they can control themselves. Strength is not in talking too much, is in relaxing. And letting know and asking yourself, what is the will of God that I should react? And you have the strength to let God control you. When you meek, you put self aside. You put what you want to say and you say what God wants you to say. You put aside how you want to act and you act the way God wants you to act. It is power under control. And don't equate gentleness or cowardice, lack of conviction, or mere human niceness. It's a virtue that draws courage, strength, conviction, and good disposition from God. Not from self-centered human resources. person who is meek draws a strength from God. Do you know how much strength... Jesus needed when as a human being he was being punched in the face spit on but Jesus was so strong that he controlled his humanness and let me tell you he had power <laughs> he had the power to look up at Caiaphas and make him disappear But he constrained that because he loved you and I more than himself. That's being meek. And you and I don't even have a million, one millionth of the power that he did. Remember when they went to the garden, they picked him up. <laughs> See, people, you know, that when, when you're blind to the power of God, there's nothing that God can do to save you. When you want to be blind, remember, blind is a choice, it's a choice that you made. Okay? You're not blind. You decided to be blind. When they came and they, uh, they said, are you? He said, yes, I am. He looked at them, they all dropped to the floor. <laughs> then he realized what happened. When you're blind, when you want to be blind, right? Remember, and then they, they tied his hands, right? Remember that? They tied his hands. His hands tied up. Then, then you know, Peter went crazy. <laughs> you know, Peter grabbed the sword and tried to ch chop some guy's head off, and the guy ducked, and he got his ear. <laughs> ear went flying. Jesus went like this, picked up the ear. Put in thing. <laughs> and nobody even realized what just happened. Can you see his meekness between go ahead guys? I need to save Juan. I need to save I need to save Mary. I need to save Joe. Go ahead. Take me in. And he told Peter, he says, don't you know, Peter, that if I want to, if I want to, all hell will break loose right here. Let it go. Why? Because the will of God and the plan of salvation was more important in him than anything else. People, when you learn that, when we learn that, that is significance of meekness. It's God first and his plan first no matter what. Now, being meek is a whole other thing because you, you can call. See, now this meekness part, I, you know, this meekness part is something else. Because you see, for you to say, I am poor in spirit, that's okay. Remember, you're the one saying it. 
You can say, I am, I am a sinner. That's okay. Because you're the one saying it. But being meek involves another person. You can call yourself poor, but if someone else calls you poor spiritually, how do you act? You can call yourself a sinner. Oh, no, when we talk, you know, it's like when we're ready to, when, when we are ready to talk about somebody else, what do we do? We put up a guard. I know I'm the first sinner of everyone, you know. But the, it's only a setup. They're making themselves comfortable before they talk about another person. <laughs> All right. All right, first of all, I, I'm, you know, I'm a sinner too, you know. We're okay with calling ourselves sinners, but what do we do when somebody else calls us a sinner? How do you handle that? See, that has to do with meekness. What do you do when somebody, we can mistreat ourselves and we can say, well, I'm poor in spirit. Because somehow when you say that, it's like, it's like saying, I am proud of my humbleness. You know? I am proud of my humbleness. See, I call myself sinner first. There's like pride in that. But what about when somebody calls you a sinner? When somebody tells you that you're wrong. When somebody tells you what is your reaction? Is your reaction to defend yourself right away? Is your, or do you have a spirit of meekness to allow God to take care of it? I can say this and I can say that, but that's all right. I always tell people, that defending yourself with words means nothing. There's two witnesses. And there's one witness that is over everything, and that's always time. Time will always tell the truth. Time will always tell the truth. You can say anything you want, people. See, words are, you know... Sometimes when things happen in my life and people say, well, why don't you talk? Why? I can say anything. I can be lying. Words are nothing. But time will always tell the truth. No matter what, time will always tell the truth. And sometimes we think we have to defend ourselves about everything and we have to be up there for everything and we have to, w- without knowing that, 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 that God is in control of everything. But you're strong enough to stand who, with who you are. As I was studying this, I said, you know, there's, and, and, and something hit me. Something hit me. It's part of meekness. And it hit me this morning. I, I didn't write it down in my sermon. Because it hit me this morning. I said, you know, we all like to minister from a point of perfection. See, I like to preach to you from a state of perfection because that makes me feel like I have the authority to say stuff to you but you know what meekness is meekness has to do when you screwed up in your life your whole church knows about it but God has transformed your life And yet you are willing to stand up and minister, though people know you've screwed up in your life. That takes meekness. When you take a vessel, have you said, you know what they do in in Japan or China? I don't know which one, right? And they take these broken vessels, right? They don't throw them away, right? What they do is they take the vessel and, put them, and they put it with gold. They, they mend them together with gold. And these vessels actually become stronger. Stronger. When they've been broken and then they're mended and then you can drink from them. Now, 
when a person has been broken and beaten by the devil and they have fallen into temptation and they rise up out of that and they are still willing to minister when people know, knowing that people know who they were, that, is, that takes a lot of strength. But it's meekness to say, I have a message, and I don't care what you think. My message is important. Now, the person who's listening, okay, and say, I can't listen to this person because I know what they did in the past. Here's what you've done. See, this person has already been forgiven, and they're good, but now you've taken on their sin. you're the one who's carrying that load now. They're free. But since you seem to bring that up and keep that in you now in your head of what this person did in the past, guess what? Now that sin is on you. This person is free from it. But now you own that sin. Now that sin is holding you from listening to the word. Now your sin is holding you back from listening to the power of God of repentance and forgiveness. Now that sin is affecting you. It's not affecting the person. They're done with it. But it's affecting you. And now you carry on that sin. See, people, meekness has to do also when you and I know that we're not perfect. That we have stuff that God knows. Forget about the people that God knows. That isn't right. But yet we say, God, you know who I am. I know who I am. Use me. The woman who fell at the feet of Jesus, John chapter 8, who they brought to Jesus, she left that place free of her sins. But the men who left the way, they took her sin with them in their hearts. Meekness has to do sometimes with knowing that we don't have this to offer, but yet we say, God, use me anyway. That's why Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am, the, here my word says, gentle and say a lot of words, you, I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Bible gives us examples of meek persons. And one of them was David. David was a meek person. David was anointed king. God anointed him as king. And yet he was running, trying to hide from the king who he knew was done. He was anointed king. But yet he, he kept running and kept hiding, you know, till God said, it's time. And he had Saul at his hands twice. In other words, meekness is not weakness. He had the strength to take his life, but the will of God was more important to him. And he said, no, God will take care of Saul, not me. God will take, and the soldier said, listen, God is putting him in your hands. <laughs> he said, no, nah. that's still God's anointed. God will take care of his anointed. Twice. He did that. And he was already anointed king. And for years he ran and hid. Jeremiah with his message. Jeremiah's message was a powerful message. And he was put under in a well. And he was mistreated. And he was doing, you know, all these things. Moses. Moses who was, who was offered to be Pharaoh of the largest empire of his time. Decided to side with slaves. 
In fact, meekness is compatible with great strength. Meekness is compatible with great authority and power. These people we have looked at have been great defenders of the truth. The meek man is one who may believe in standing, who, who, who believes in standing for truth, that he will die for it if necessary. The martyrs were meek, but they were never weak. Strong men yet, strong men and women, yet meek men. God forbid that we should ever refuse this characteristic of being meek because it is powerful and it is strong. Only a weak person cannot control their mouth. Only the weak cannot control hurting people. Only the weak need to say it and get it out so that they can feel good. Only the weak do that. The meek have control over themselves because they are strong. The meek only speak what the Spirit of God tells them to speak. The meek have the strength of God to say no, not because they feel like saying no, but because it is godly to say no. And they will say yes, not because it feels good to say yes, but because it is godly to say yes. The meek are controlled by the Holy Spirit. The meek are not controlled by feelings. They are controlled by the principles of God. The meek. And I'm going to finish with this. I had the next one, but I guess I got a free sermon for next week now. (laughs) But the meek are able to put aside the agenda of this world and the agenda that the church that the world pushes on you remember this people listen to this the wor- the world pushes on you an agenda that seems good but the meek push away the agenda that the world gives them and follow the god's agenda When Jesus was here, a lot of pressure was put on him because he was a teacher, he was a rabbi, and he had power. Let me tell you something, people. Jesus had power, not only here, but people. When when you talk about 15,000 people, and I tell you, you know, he fed 5,000, right? He says, without counting the what? The women and children. And, and, And you know that more women follow Jesus than men. Simple as that. Okay? More women follow Jesus than men. So you know there must have been at least 15,000 people. Let me tell you something, people. If in those days, without a microphone, without any, any, any audio visual, he, he had no you know, pictures throwing up. He was doing none of that stuff. You know? and, and he didn't have a mic. And yet he had from 15 people, 15,000 people follow him. Don't you think he was a man with power and authority? This was a powerful man. Multitudes followed him. Where he went, multitudes went. And the Jews of his time wanted to use Jesus for their agendas. Because of the Romans and justice and all this kind of stuff. You gotta, you know, they're making us do this. Because that's what that's the kind of Messiah that they wanted. But Jesus knew that the Romans weren't the problem. Jesus knew that sin was the problem. And sometimes Christians, we fall for all this stuff. Oh, Jesus could have, Jesus could have joined any of these movements. And they were dying for, Judas was one of them. And they were dying to get Jesus to to join all these justice movements. Oh, but Jesus knew that there ain't no justice movement in this world that will solve the problem. And he stayed faithful to the cross. Jesus knew the answer. We as Christians better know what the answer is. Because if not, we fall for it too. We have to know that sin is the problem. And that falls into the next one. Blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. 
but you got to be careful about righteousness you're falling for. You better be careful. Because you might be chasing man's righteousness instead of God's righteousness. God has invited us to be part of his kingdom. God has invited us to be part of a special people, not in the future, but today. And we need to take our minds off the future and put it in the present because, like I said, like I said there's no future without a present. And God expects us to to have his characteristics today. You know, I, I, I want to pray for God to give me meekness. Powerful meekness. Meekness that will make me strong to do his will instead of my will. Meekness to put others first. Meekness to put God first. Meekness to, to not only drive this, you know, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a, you guys know me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm passionate about stuff. I, and sometimes, you know, it, it just, and, and, and I ask God to take that away from me. It turned me into a meek person because a meek person is a strong person that is able to, to put away our own wants and desires, our own words, take them out of us and put the words of God and take, and take my emotions and put in the emotions of God and put in these things that, that, that God needs within us so that, you know why, people? So that we can be happy. Who says blessed are those. Happy are those. Happy are those. Who put away your own pride. Put away your own emotions. Put away your own desire. Put away your own words. Put all that away. And you put and you take God's words and God's desires and God's will and he says that if you do that you will be happy see we, a lot of times we think the final I just gotta say it I just gotta say it to feel good no you're destroying yourself Jesus says completely the opposite if you're meek you will be happy you will enjoy life more. That's my desire today. Is that your desire today? Is that your desire to, to ask God to give you meekness? To give you the desire to have his will fulfilled in your life? I'd like to pray for you. If, there's, if you feel that desire here, to, because I think that's important for our church people. I think that's important for our church. And if you feel that, I, I, if you want to stand up, I'd like to pray for you. That God will, will give us that spirit of meekness. That God will help me. That God will help you. And we become a, a church of meek people. Church of meek people. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for your blessings. And we thank you for giving us the, the opportunity to just be here today and to worship you. Lord, we are poor in spirit. We mourn because of our sinful nature. But God, therefore, because of that, we are meek. And we want to experience meekness. We want to be the people that you want us to be. We want to be, we want to be who you want us to be. Help us, Lord, to take away our ego to take away our selfishness, to take away our pride, and that we may be strong, strong for you, strong to be like you want us to be. 
We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good afternoon, church. As always, it's a real blessing to be able to worship with you this afternoon. And I just want to always thank you guys for um, your continued support of Origin. Uh, we know that everything that we do for the community and everyone that we impact is because of the faithful giving, the spirit-led giving here in this church. And we just want to thank you for that and um, to give you an opportunity to give. If you want to give, you can always go to originchurch.com forward slash give. We also have um, envelopes and... Um, connection cards in front of you, right in front of you, that you can use to give as well. Uh, we do have lunch this afternoon, so we hope that you'll be able to stick around and fellowship. And for those of you who are participating in Freedom, we want to remind you that we're going to meet right back here at 2.30 this afternoon. Happy Sabbath, and we'll see you next week.